Welcome to Morris Township's June 3rd Planning Board hearing. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. I'd like to state for the record that legal notice required in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act has been satisfied and the statement certifying the same will be executed. I ask everybody to rise for a pledge of allegiance. In the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. And a prayer would probably help us all. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, Sonia, can we get a roll call? Yes, Mr. Chen. Mr. Here. Mr. Van Order. Here. Mr. Nunn. Here. Mr. Rabbit. Here. Ms. Murphy. Here. Mr. Benoit. Here. Mr. Barrett. Here. Mr. Rinkin. Here. Mr. Alesso. Here. Mr. Warner. Here. Mr. Phillips. Here. Mr. Slay. Here. And our son is Santiago. Okay, our first order of business tonight is a resolution for from Enforcer. Uh, would you like to see it up? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. If, let me, if I may, with your permission, also just mention that the Lytle US LLC uh, resolution uh, will be available for uh, consideration for adoption at our next meeting. Uh, the Crum and Foster resolution uh, was distributed to you prior to this evening. Uh, that was an amended site plan approval for an existing uh, and then replaced freestanding identification sign at 305 Madison Avenue. The board will recall it was approved uh, unanimously, 9-0, uh, and uh, the primary condition of approval was that the sign's internal lighting system uh, shall be either off between 10.30 p.m. and dawn or uh, a timer uh, dimming the brightness of the uh, lighting by 50%. Uh, during that period of time. There were other conditions, of course, as always, uh, but that was the primary one. Hopefully the resolution as drafted is an accurate memorialization of what you decided and why you decided it. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Board members, anyone have any questions? I'd like to paint a motion. So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we need a roll call vote? Uh, uh, yes, if you would, please. Uh, those follow up. I get where I am. Uh, Mr. Alesso. No. Mr. Alesso. Yes. Ms. Van Order. Yes. Mr. Nunn. Yes. Mr. Rabbit. Yes. Mr. Murphy. Yes. Mr. Benoit. Yes. Mr. Flowers. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Warner, you, uh, sorry, Sonia, will you introduce the next applicant? Yes. Next application is PB0121, Joseph Savage. For minor subdivision variance and waiver, this is block 2301, lot 834, Starlight Drive in the RA15 zone. The applicant proposes a minor subdivision to create one additional lot. Good evening. Good evening. For the record's purpose, my name is Stephen Sheppis. I'm the applicant's attorney. Seated over there to my left, your right, and Mr. and Mrs. Savage, then the applicant. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Warner, maybe it's appropriate for all the witnesses and all of our professionals to be sworn in at the same time. Certainly, I'll uh, do that. Do we have your witnesses uh, yes. available? They are. Uh, seated uh, behind me is Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker is a licensed professional engineer. Uh, to Mr. Walker's left is uh, Nicholas Graviano, is a licensed professional planner. And no one else will be testifying. We don't anticipate any other witnesses. Okay, I'll swear them both in along with our board professionals, our planner, uh, Mr. Phillips, and our engineer. Uh, Mr. Slate, will all of you raise your right hand? Do all of you swear to God or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you all. And before counsel uh, gives his opening, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I did have an opportunity to review the notice, found the content to be sufficient, found it to be timely served, certified mail on May 16, uh, published in our official newspaper on May 17. Uh, both of those dates being at least 10 days prior to this evening, June 3rd. So the board does have jurisdiction to hear and decide the application tonight. Thank you, Mr. Warren. You're welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Applicant's attorney, would you like to open? Oh, sure. 
Well, look, first I'd like to give you an aerial photograph of the subject property that was provided by the Morris County Planning Board based on aerial photography from 2018. It's the most recent available. I think the aerial photograph from the county will help put the entire application in good perspective. So I'd like to have this marked as Exhibit A1 and then uh, hand up copies to the board and board professionals. I also have some extra copies for the, uh, for the audience. Or, so, like. so if I could uh, hand this up and we can somehow make that on the... Uh, That's fine. And I'm correct that it, uh, there'll be a witness will be testifying as to it, correct? Sure. Okay. Um, shall I approach? Maybe Mr. Chairman? Yes, of course. Sorry. Uh, if you can just please watch this step. That's the legal warning, and you make no warning. That absolves us of all liability, right? That's right. Yes, eight one one. Sorry, could we have some more copies? There's right here. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, now, Mr. Walker, you've been sworn, so I'm going to ask that you briefly state your credentials for the record. Sure. Um, I hold a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Northeastern University, master's degree in environmental engineering from NJIT, been licensed to practice uh, engineering in the state of New Jersey for over 32 years. I, know I, I look younger than that, but, um, and I, I don't know if I've ever testified in front of this board. I may have along the way or someone else from my firm. I'm a principal at Dykstra Walker Design Group. We're located in Lake Apacon, 21 Bowling Green Parkway. Um, and we do a lot of work in uh, Morris County. Um, so I, I am licensed and my license is current. Okay. I offer Mr. Walker as a licensed professional engineer. I just want to round out the record, if I may, Mr. Chairman, though I take it even though you may not have been accepted by this board, you've been accepted by other land use boards in the state of New Jersey as an expert in the field of civil engineering? Yes, I am. Okay, and also being sought uh, as a surveyor or just civil engineer? Civil engineer only. Only, okay, thank you. Thank you. you remain accepted. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Now, Mr. Walker, I know you bring you brought your own exhibit with you this evening. I did. Aerial based on aerial photography. I did. So perhaps what you can do is we can uh, introduce that. You can tell us what it is, how it was prepared, how many sheets it is, and then from there we'll hand them out. Okay. So it's three sheets. The first sheet is entitled Existing <laughs> Conditions Exhibit. It's basically the survey superimposed on an aerial photograph. Uh, the second is a proposed subdivision exhibit, which is the plan that you have before you tonight. And it's just a colorized exhibit, again, superimposed on an aerial photograph. And the third is entitled uh, alternate subdivision exhibit. It's just a slight modification of the property line. All the improvements uh, are the same. And again, it's a rendered plan over a aerial photograph. All right, now, Mr. Walker, these exhibits were prepared by your office or under your supervision. Is that fair to say? That's correct. And they're all, they all have today's date, and June 3rd. Based on the survey that's the subject of tonight's application. That is correct, yes. Okay, now, uh, collectively, should we, uh, this is a matter of uh, board procedure. We could do it as one uh, three page compendium. We got the three pages already identified, so uh, just give it a name uh, as a compendium. Um, and, Exhi and exhibits. Subdivision sub exhibits. Sub subdivision exhibits, that's fine. Very well. All right, Mr. Walker, do you have enough for the uh, for I, the board I members? I do. I should have 19 here, so we might have some for the audience as well. And again, for the record, Exhibit A2 is a three-page compendium uh, entitled Subdivision Exhibits. Same caution apply if I go up yes, yeah. it's, a, it's a standing caution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Nice. We have enough there? Maybe one, uh, one more? Yeah. 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 Yeah
No, no. We got it. There you go. We got it. You want more? <laughs> Our planner was able to get the, those up digi digitally as well, so we have them on the screen. All right, so Mr. Walker, why don't you walk us through uh, what we've marked as A2. Tell us how it uh, assists the board in their fact-finding determination. Sure. So um, as you can see, the, the property boundaries marked in white. It's 5.47 acres with 152 feet of uh, lot width fronting on Starlight Drive. Um, there's an existing dwelling, uh, a long circular driveway, a detached garage, a shed, a tennis court. That you can see that's uh, striped. Um, we also have uh, a stream that runs through the property and there's uh, a combination of several drainage pipes coming from Starlight Drive that discharge into uh, that area creating the stream. It's about 117 acres draining through the stream area. Um, the stream has, we have got a verification from the DEP They've designated the stream uh, with a 50-foot riparian buffer. And because we have more than 50 acres draining to it, it also has an associated flood hazard area that's defined. And we've received uh, a, the verification from the DEP indicating the, uh, the flood hazard uh, elevation. And we've defined that on the map as well. Um, we have also, because we have a stream, we also have some wetlands and those are the uh, the white marks uh, patterned throughout the uh, throughout the plan, and uh, the the wetlands themselves have been designated as an intermediate resource value wetland, which holds a 50 foot transition area. So we have a 50 foot transition area on the wetlands and a 50 foot riparian buffer on the stream. Now the stream is located well inside of the wetlands and the the riparian buffer really doesn't come into play uh, for our particular subdivision. Uh, the, east, the easterly property line, the far end opposite of Starlight Drive, actually has an off-site sanitary sewer uh, easement and a sanitary sewer main. And the existing house that's on the property connects to that sanitary sewer easement. The property is located in the RA15 zone which only requires 15,000 square feet. This particular lot, as you can see, is very large and it's over 15 times the required size for this particular zone. So we've got an incredibly large piece of property uh, in, this, in this smaller lot size zone. The lot width required is 100 feet. <clears throat> the property is gently sloping and primarily towards the stream. 85.6% of the property contains slopes that are less than 15%. So that, that indicates that the property is basically uh, uh, not, uh, re not meeting, needing to meet the requirements of the steep slope, 86.5% of the property. But there are a couple of pockets of slopes uh, within the property, but predominantly the property is less than 15% uh, overall. Um, and other than the uh, developed area for the existing home and all the accessory structures, the property is predominantly wooded. <clears throat> um, the wetlands, as I mentioned, have been, uh, have been defined by our wetland consultant. And uh, there's actually been permitting plans submitted for a statewide general permit number 10a which is a, a minor road crossing permit and we'll get into that a little bit as we go a little bit further uh, into the project <clears throat> in the dep we we were on some calls with them about uh about the permit um and they did indicate that they were going to be issuing the permit uh for the project uh, we just we just don't have it yet and, and, and dealing in this business, you know how long it takes to uh, get the DEP to issue permits. So 
but verbally we have been, they have indicated that they will be uh, issuing a permit for us. <clears throat> so if you want to flip to the second sheet in our exhibit, we're looking at the, uh, the proposed plan and you can see in the blue is the, the stream running through the, uh, the property. Um, the light green is the area of the wetlands. There's a blue line on there that is the approved flood hazard area limit. And then there's a red line that you got to look a little bit for. That is the actual wetland buffer. All right, so you can see that the proposed driveway goes through the wetland buffer in a couple of locations. And then there are a proposed densely planted area uh, shown on there uh, as proposed plantings. And that's the area where the tennis court uh, is located. So part of our negotiations with the DEP, we wanted to keep the tennis court as a sports court. And the DEP was like, look, you get rid of the, you get rid of the tennis court, we'll give you, we'll give you approval for this. So um, we made an agreement. We came up with a planting plan that they were uh, agreeable to. So the tennis court's gone. Um, we do have a turnaround shown in the area where the tennis court is located. Uh, and that was really uh, designated by the fire department. They really wanted to have you know, an emergency vehicle turnaround uh, at the end of the project. So if you look at this, uh, if you look at this uh, property, I don't know, uh, Nick, can you, is there any way you could zoom in on the entryway? Looking at the, the screen, we have a little bit of a jog uh, in the proposed property line. And, you know, at the time when we were doing this, it was really our intent to make sure that each lot had its own driveway on its own lot. And uh, what happened is as you get closer to the entranceway, that flood hazard area pushes in and it requires us to shrink the driveway down. So we have a 75 foot section from the edge of Starlight Drive into where our driveway splits off into two ind independent driveways where we have a small area of common driveway. And that helped us stay away from the flood hazard area and avoid additional permit. Uh, and preserve the vegetation in that area. So, so at any rate, what we did was we had uh, we had a, we had the first about seventy five feet of the property line is uh, a common driveway, and we have two lots proposed: lot eight point oh two, which is the largest lot, and the smaller lot is eight point oh one. So, eight point oh two in this scenario requires a, about a seventy maybe a little bit less, 75 from the edge of the pavement. So maybe 65 feet of a uh, common driveway that it has to travel over it needs, uh, would require a uh, common access and utility easement over the smaller lot, lot 8.01. And then as you, as you come in, let's come in off from Starlight Drive, we, we come in, the, the driveway gets wider, uh, and then uh, the, the property line jogs in and the driveway for lot 8.02 is now on its own lot. And the proposed lot line runs in between the two driveways and runs back. And then we have a nice uh, angle point and the property line, proposed property lines perpendicular with the southerly, existing southerly sideline. Right, and it creates nice lots back there. They're they're side by side. It creates a nice, nice uh, way to designate these properties and creates very usable front rear yards uh, for these properties. Um, so the, the driveway, uh, as we went through some discussions with the fire department through Mr. Slate's office, uh, they really wanted to have a 11 foot wide driveway with uh, two three foot stone shoulders. So, uh, so that's six, so it's 17 foot wide effective area for uh, a fire truck to navigate. And uh, you know, after getting the, the specifications, we came up with a design, submitted that into the fire department and they were acceptable not only to the turnaround, but the, the proposed driveway that we have shown. And then the way that it's designed is they could actually have, the fire truck could actually have one set of tires on one driveway 
one set of tires on the other driveway if they wanted to. There's there's no fence proposed in between. There's only a three foot stone area. And the, three, the, the stone area actually provides two functions. One is support for the fire vehicles and also helps to infiltrate storm water into the ground. So it's actually providing two, two benefits uh, in that area. So just taking a look at the lots themselves, as I mentioned, you know, we do have a very large piece of property. We don't have any issue with lot area here. The smaller lot is two times uh, the required size. It's 30,073 square feet and the larger lots, 208,049 square feet, way bigger than, than what's required. Um, but in looking at this lot, we do have a, an issue with the existing lot width. So the existing lot width was about 152 feet and the zone requires 100 foot per lot. So uh, we're coming up a little bit short with our lot width. So there's you know, a couple of ways to uh, remedy that. Probably actually one way to remedy that. One way would be is to just create more right of way which creates more frontage and creates more lot width. And originally in the, in the early part of the application, a uh, concept from, a, from another engineer that was working on this before we got involved, uh, got involved and created that, uh, that type of a concept with a cul-de-sac and, and I don't know if it was three or four lots, but it was multiple lots, more than two lots. And uh, so we've actually found in, in especially since the stormwater regulations have changed, made things a lot more complicated. That basically, if you're doing a small public road, for one thing, it's a burden on the municipality. And two, it's basically a break even because by the time you go through all of the procedures and approval process, map filing law, meeting all the stormwater rules and regulations, you end up basically building this beautiful road that takes away the value of one of the lots and you basically from a financial standpoint you end up with basically two lots financially anyway so um, the way that we've always looked at these kind of things is it's actually just as easy to have either a private road that doesn't meet the re doesn't have to meet the state requirements or driveways and in this particular instance we're considered a minor project for stormwater management. So minor project for stormwater management is uh, a project that uh, has, does not increase impervious cover by more than a quarter of an acre and does not create more than one acre of disturbance. So we meet both those criteria. We're staying as a minor uh, stormwater project and we actually have a slight reduction in impervious coverage. We have because there's the tennis court, this huge looping driveway, a house, a garage, sheds, all this stuff on the property. Our plan, which is fairly uh, tight and concise, actually generates less impervious coverage than what's on the site today. So we're at a minus 760 uh, impervious coverage, and we're showing that the driveways are all <coughs> pitching towards those stone areas that uh, the fire department wanted us to have, which is going to help uh, with increasing infiltration and help managing uh, stormwater management on our property. Um, so uh, with respect to our lot width, um, we are under this scenario where we shrunk the one lot down quite a bit with lot width and we made the other lot comply with lot width. Um, let me just run through the numbers uh, for the board. So the, the lot width uh, for 802, which is the smaller lot, um, or 801, which is the smaller lot, is, lot is 32.9 feet, and the larger lot is 119.1. So it's actually, we could have modified the line and taken the extra 19.1 and added it on to the smaller lot. That, that was definitely a possibility. We also have another... Uh, alternative, which is the next exhibit, which we'll get into, and we can compare the two and uh, see if there's a, see if there's a, a concept there that the board would prefer. Um, I don't believe that it matters to the applicant uh, either way. 
So we comply with, uh, other than that one lot width, we comply with all the bulk requirements uh, for the RA15 zone for these two, uh, these two lots. Um, so we will have um, to serve these properties uh, with uh, water, sewer, gas, electric, and internet. And as I mentioned, the rear lot already connects into uh, the sanitary sewer line that's in the back. We're simply going to connect that uh, proposed dwelling into the existing sewer lateral that's there, and it'll flow gravity into that sewer main in the rear. Uh, the water, sewer, and gas, though, will be in the proposed driveway, except for the last 75 feet, and there'll be a utility easement where it can cross over proposed lot point 8.01. Now for uh, the dwelling on 8.01, all of the utilities will be uh, within the driveway area and uh, connect into Starlight Drive where the, all those utilities are available to connect in. Um, so we do have, uh, as a result of the subdivision, we do have some, some tree removal proposed. There are 59 trees that are to be removed. And as you know, in your ordinance, if you have a larger tree, a replacement tree for a larger tree is more than just a one-for-one -one, uh, type of scenario. So we went through and we analyzed uh, all the trees that are to be removed. So the 59 trees that are to be removed uh, actually re equates into 145 replacement trees. So the applicant has the option of planting smaller replacement trees or a little bit larger ones or even a little bit larger ones or actually paying for replacement trees. So um, it's hard to say, you know, at this point uh, exactly what's going to be because these homes that we have shown on our concept plan are just conceptual homes. And I think uh, that decision will ultimately, ultimately have to be made by the, the homeowner that's going to build a house uh, on that lot or however that actual house uh, lays out what makes sense uh, as far as the, are there placed planting those trees or, or making a payment uh, or a combination uh, thereof. Um, so as I mentioned, the property is primarily uh, unregulated, less than 15% slopes or over 86%. But there are a couple of small pockets of slopes uh, that do exceed 15%. Uh, and some relief is needed from that section of the slope ordinance. So Slopes between 20 and 24.99, there's an allowance of 33% disturbance within those slope categories. So you could take that area and disturb 33% of those slopes. Um, this application is proposed to disturb 38.6% 30, uh, of those slopes. So we're 5.6% over what's allowed. Um, which equates to 487 square feet of disturbance that uh, would need uh, approval. And then the, uh, the last slope category is the, the greater than 25% slopes, 0% allowed, and we are proposing to disturb about a third of the slopes within that category, uh, but there's only 833 square feet that's being disturbed. So it is relatively de minimis. And as I did mention, we have a reduction in impervious coverage. So uh, the concern with steep slopes is typically making sure that you have a nice uh, drainage plan, uh, a soil erosion and sediment control plan that gets implemented and enforced, which would go through the Morris County Soil Conservation District. So with those things in mind, I don't see any impact from an engineering standpoint on disturbing uh, these two small pockets of slopes. Mark, could you go to your plan set just so everybody can get an understanding as to where these slopes are and, sure. and the size of them in comparison? To the that one, Nick. It's um, sheet five. And while we're proceeding with that, I just want to bring to the board's attention the memo uh, from the fire department uh, dated May 30th, uh, 2024. Uh, I assume everybody received a copy of that. Yes, no, maybe so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, so uh, I, I do have a question. Were there any other reports uh, issued? 
We yeah. have the environmental. We have the environmental report. There's, well, there's a the last TCC report, April 4, 2024, from our this plan. There's the fire yeah. department report you referenced, and then there's the environmental commission report. Uh, and then, uh, well, not a report, but uh, Somerset, uh, I'm sorry, Southeast uh, Morris County, excuse me. Do we have uh, uh, MUA uh, letter May 23, 2024? What, not the one? Those are the ones I have. I took the liberty of just marking the fire department's memo as A4 in some of those. What's the date again? Oh, May 30th. May 30th. Uh, We I'm had one going. in our package from March. Oh. Uh -huh. so Mr. Walker, just so everybody understands this, the, yeah, what went into getting this memo from the fire official of uh, <coughs> the and I know uh, he's yeah. present here this evening on the uh, placard that says fire official. So that being said, could you tell us what modifications were made to the plan in order to address the fire official's concerns? I think I went over, but I'll do it again. So we... we we widened the driveways and we added the stone shoulders and we created a turnaround uh, at the back of the, uh, the back of the site for an emergency vehicle turnaround. And just so everybody understands, uh, this application doesn't necessitate the disturbance of any uh, wetlands per se, correct? Correct. And likewise, it doesn't uh, propose any disturbance of any flood hazard area either. That's correct. And is it also fair to say that all of the improvements that are proposed are primarily in areas that are already disturbed based upon the prior house, prior garage, prior tennis court, etc. That's correct. And I think, you know, the board could just simply look at the first sheet in exhibit A2 and look at the second sheet and you can see the development is in the same area. All right. So now let's talk about what's going on at the DEP. You had mentioned that the property has this stream uh, that necessitates a flood hazard area and a riparian buffer, correct? Correct. And that uh, jurisdictional limit has been defined by the DEP and the appropriate document recorded with the county clerk. Correct? That, that's correct. And likewise, the DEP defined the wetlands on the property as well and the related wet, uh, buffer. They uh, they they have reviewed it. Uh, they're working with John Peel on the uh, approval of the wetland permit. Okay, so now let's talk about the permit that's necessary. What's the nature of the permit? What does it pertain to? Or maybe you could just Tell us the, the uh, nature of the improvement that necessitates the improvement. Sure. I, as I mentioned um, on exhibit uh, A2, the second sheet, there's a red line in, on the plan, and you can see the driveway crosses it in three locations. So that's the red line, which is the wetland transition area from the wetland itself. And so where we cross that, uh, that transition area, uh, it's required to get a permit from the state of New Jersey DEP. Uh, there's also an existing driveway that's in there. And for the most part, we're following that existing driveway. Uh, and that's all part and parcel of uh, getting our uh, approval from the DEP. They've reviewed all of those different asset, facets uh, relative to that. Now, Mr. Walker, for the benefit of the public who may not understand the term transition area, could you briefly explain what a wetland transition area is as it relates to a wetland? Sure. So in the state of New Jersey, there's basically three transition areas, an ordinary, intermediate, and exceptional. Ordinary has no buffer. So like, for instance, the Morris Canal, they dug the Morris Canal out. They created a wetland uh, in that area. That's a man-made wetland or somebody dug a hole and it filled up with water and the wetland got created. That's a man-made wetland. And typically those have no transition areas, no buffers in, in layman terms. So transition areas of buffer. Uh, and then intermediate uh, means that it's mo the most common type of buffer that you would have in the state. And then uh, exceptional resource would be uh, something where the wetlands drain to trout maintenance or trout production waters or there's uh, endangered species uh, within a habitat range uh, of the wetlands. Um, so those are basically the three buffers in the exceptional resource uh, wetland has a 150 foot buffer. So 
Uh, anytime you encroach within the buffer, the rules are very, uh, there's a whole set of rules associated with what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, just because you have a buffer doesn't mean you can't do anything, uh, but it comes under the, the full review of the Department of Environmental Protection in the state of New Jersey. Now, Mr. Walker, is it fair to say in layman's term, a buffer, AKA a transition area is an area adjacent to a wetland that is not a wetland itself, but rather is a, I'll call it a, an area beyond the wetland that is not to be disturbed without a permit. That's correct. Okay, now, when we look at the exhibit that you have, uh, that's up on the screen, uh, can you tell us what portion of the property would remain in its natural state, or perhaps the converse is easier to explain, so the board and the public can understand as to the nature and extent of the development as it relates to the public park. Right. Well, I think if you look at the exhibit um, and, and the area of the tennis court that we're removing and we're creating all those plantings, that's all within the buffer, the transition area. So the DEP wanted us to create transition area plantings, plantings that simulate what's normally in a, a wetland transition area that you'd find, you know, in the nature, out in the nature. So, uh, so that area is in there. So if you look at the the driveway area to the north, basically that entire area is not proposed to be disturbed. It's all heavily regulated. Um, uh, so you could see that our area of development for this site, just visually looking at it is less than, less than a fifth of the overall property. So probably about four fifths of the property will not be touched. Now, Mr. Walker, drawing your attention to uh, this uh, subdivision exhibit that's up on the screen, you noted this red line, which represents the wetlands buffer and the need for the permit to cross it. Now, that red line does continue on uh, to the easterly sideline of the property as well, correct? Uh, yes, it does. <clears throat> so is it fair to say that everything within that red line, i.e. to the north of that red line, uh, would remain as it is today, undisturbed. Yes, to the north and the east. Yep. So is it also fair to say that you're not touching uh, the stream in any way or modifying the uh, water course or the wetlands themselves, just simply what you propose here on this plan? That's correct. We cannot get anywhere near the stream. All right. So uh, why don't you proceed where, where I interrupted you? Well, um, the oh, you're going to show us the, uh, the slopes. Yeah. The slopes. Oh, the slopes. Did we get the? Do you have any luck with that, Nick? Oh, here you go. Okay, so the way our slope map is shown, which is actually, I believe, sheet five uh, in the plan set, the areas that have no shading are areas that are less than fifteen percent. Uh, the areas with the next uh, degree of shading are the next slope category, uh, which are 15 to 20 percent, and then a little darker, 20 to 25 percent, and then greater than 25 percent are the darkest slopes that are shown. So as you can see, right at the back end of the project, there is uh, a little bit of disturbance that's taking place uh, within that area. Uh, and that's the area where the uh, slope disturbances occur. I know, Mr. Walker, is it fair to say that that area is uh, adjacent to where the home uh, used to be located, the steeper area? Uh, yes, yes it is. Is it also a fair to characterize that much of the area that's being proposed for disturbance is already disturbed presently? There is, uh, there is, it's primarily disturbed. There is a little bit of an expansion uh, in that particular area where there is some tree removal. Okay. Now, in conjunction with this application, we've asked for design exceptions from Section 51, as authorized by Section 51 of the MLUL, authorizing disturbance of uh, these uh, slope categories. Can you tell us from a practical standpoint? Uh, have you endeavored to minimize the amount of disturbance in order to try to limit or eliminate this request? Um, we have, you know, actually, there's a couple of things that are, you know, kind of uh, making sure that we don't expand our limited disturbance. And one is in order to meet and to maintain our project as a minor stormwater project, 
we need to stay under that one acre of disturbance. So we're pretty close to that one acre of disturbance number as it is to fit these two properties in and provide a nice front yard and rear yard and make these properties really desirable. Uh, so uh, that is the, any disturbance beyond this limit, it, it's a cumulative thing for the stormwater. They, if they go beyond that area uh, and the enforcement catches up with them, they could be forced to provide a major stormwater plan for their own individual lot. So uh, any plan that we have shown, we will not be showing any more disturbance than what's shown on this concept plan. Okay. All right, so uh, Mr. Walker, can you show us the other uh, alternative that you came up with? Uh, sure. So uh, in preparing for the meeting, we had some team meetings and we had some discussions about, you know, the proposed property line. And I think, you know, originally, as I mentioned, the objective was to make sure that, you know, the, the properties were as most as possible, the, the driveways would stay on each individual lot. So in the plan that we presented, that was our objective. Um, but we were kind of out of balance relative to lot width. One lot complies and the other lot's, you know, coming up really short. So uh, in an effort to uh, balance the lot width requirements, we did the third uh, image that you have in your in your packet for exhibit number two. And you could see that the proposed property line basically splits the frontage and the lot width. And we end up with two lots that are 76 feet in lot width. And basically, the property line that's between the two proposed dwellings remained the same. We simply extended that out further until it intercepted with the property line uh, bisecting Starlight, Star, Starlight Drive and creating uh, equal lot widths. So we just uh, made a simple line. It is a much cleaner looking property line. Uh, Mr. Walker, while you have this exhibit up, uh, I note that the proposed homes uh, have backyard to backyard to the homes on Fieldstone Drive. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Yep. So, so in other words, it would be like a conventional subdivision with backyards backing up to one another. That's correct. All right. Now let's talk about stormwater management. Uh, I note that uh, you testified there was a reduction in overall impervious coverage. Uh, based on that, can you tell the members of the board and the public as to whether or not stormwater management has been adequately addressed in your engineering professional opinion or whether you could uh, provide some other type of stormwater management infrastructure to do so? Well, we have by putting in those stone three foot wide stone areas, that's going to infiltrate the entire driveways that are proposed in there. So we have relatively long driveways. So that's going to really help uh, reduce the runoff coming off the property. Uh, and then also, you know, this conceptual plan um, shows a reduction. If, a, if somebody else comes in with another plan, all this stormwater gets reviewed again by the engineering department uh, at the time of a building permit. So there could be a requirement to add some additional stormwater at that time. But right now, the way that we have it shown, we're, we're under the impervious cover as it exists today, and we're providing some additional stormwater infiltration. And Mr. Walker, I know you testified to this, but just so that uh, in case somebody missed it in the audience, uh, is it fair to say that the two homes proposed would be serviced with municipal water, uh, municipal water, I'm sorry, municipal water, municipal sewer, natural gas, and of course, electric? That's correct. Okay, so there's no septic systems or wells proposed. That is correct. Okay. Um, and Mr. Walker, last question I have for you. The basic topography lay of the land, which way did the property drain towards? So it drains away from Starlight Drive, right? And then it's a little bit of a canyon effect where the grade slopes down to the brook. All right. I don't have anything further, Mr. Walker. Mr. Slate, we'd like to start with you. Do you have any questions? 
Um, yeah, would the applicant be willing to uh, camera the existing, assuming there's some sort of approval on this, camera the existing sanitary sewer line just to make sure it's in decent shape for a connection? Yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah. And uh, would the applicant also be willing? I, I, I know it's called out as a three foot uh, stone shoulder, but I didn't see a specific detail as to the depth of the stone or what's going to be done with that. So we would need a detail. And what would you anticipate uh, that stone shoulder being constructed out of? Uh, larger stones, like two, two and a half inch stones on the top, and then smaller stones underneath. So probably going with a, uh, a, a two foot depth and then possibly a wick to make sure that we get down to some well-drained soil and replace that with uh, some select fill or some gravel to make sure that it does drain. And then the last question I had was related to uh, the area of disturbance within the wetland buffer area. Is that... Uh, require buffer averaging or does the GP10 cover that based upon the amount of disturbance that's allowed under that general permit? Yeah, only a GP10A is what was required to be filed. The DEP was satisfied with that. I have uh, no other questions. Thank you. Mr. Phillips? Yeah, I want to ask a question about the calculation of lot width and I think I know what the answer is going to be, and then I think we need input also from Jim and, and Steve. So as I understand it, for the lot width, it appears that you took the three points that are cited in the definition of lot width and Correct. you averaged them. Correct. Is that okay? So so just for the board, it's uh, it's at the frontage, at the building setback line, and 40 feet beyond the building setback line. Okay. Um, and I guess the, the issue for consideration is in that definition, it mentions those three points, but it doesn't go on to say that you should take the average of those points, uh, which may mean that you have to calculate it at three points. And if you don't meet it at those three points, you may need a technical variance for three lot widths. But I'm going to, I think that's the way it reads, but that's how I would interpret it. But Jim, you've been here longer than me and you've, you know, interpreted this ordinance longer, but, and that, if, if that's correct, that you don't average it, it may actually change this a bit and it may prompt a lot with variance from 802 as well as 801. But I want to, I think we should get Jim's input. And I may have given Mr. Walker misinformation on that, but as I read the ordinance, because I may have told you to average it. Uh, but uh, a after discussing the issue with Paul, I mean, it is clear that the definition does not say, uh, you know, to average those numbers. I do note that on lot depth, it does specifically say to average, uh, you know, the distances between the front lot line and back lot line if they're not parallel. So uh, I, I think it is, a, you know, there's... Uh, you know, it's noted that a variance is required for lot width, but I think it just becomes technical that it's not lot width has three different locations and on that, uh, you know, other lot as well. From a legal perspective, clear as day, it's uh, three different points, and, uh, and, and that is how we have uh, considered it, at least since I've been here. Uh, we've required uh, variances uh, where needed. Uh, at both the uh, lot width at the frontage, lot width at the front yard setback, building setback, and 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 lot width measured at uh, for each lot at the uh, 40 foot beyond uh, the front yard setback. So we do need to calculate that numbers. I will say uh, the good news for the applicant is that, uh, in my legal opinion, the uh, notice is sufficient in that it talks about the lot width, has a magnitude, and also has the appropriate catch-all language. Uh, so the board has jurisdiction uh, to hear the application and decide the application based on what I'm anticipating to be momentarily an amendment to that application because we'll be seeking lot with that at least three, maybe more than three points. And the only other thing I'll add, and I don't want to presuppose and I don't want to speak for the applicant's planning witness, but I don't believe that these technical variants are going to change the substance of their arguments for the variances. I don't want to make your planner's case, 
but I don't believe substantively it is going to be an issue, but we can we can wait to, to hear from the witness. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Warren, can I go through the board and then you be the backstop for us? Sure. <laughs> Ms. Murphy? Um, I have a question. Um, is the, the difference between view A and view B, if I could uh, put it in my own words, is that you were trying to meet the TCC's advice that you should have a separate um, driveway for both lots. So you put the, on view A, you had the lot line running down the middle of the driveway um, to try to meet that criteria. In view B, it is a more expansive property line that has a, a bigger percentage of the driveway as shared. Um, and, and I guess my follow on question, once you nod and say, yes, I'm right, is uh, uh, what is the, what is the um, approach to ensuring that we don't have issues in the future between these two property owners who are debating maintenance issues relative to the driveway, which would include things like snow removal, repaving, you know, yada, 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 because that's the reason that the TCC and we as a board generally don't like mm -hmm. shared driveways. Yep. It always yep. deteriorates at some point. So uh, can you just speak to that, please? Sure. So, you know, with that in mind, we really wanted to have two independent driveways the whole way. But, uh, but because of the environmental restrictions near the, near the entryway, we had to combine the two driveways. So we did the best that we could, but there's 75 feet of driveway to Starlight Drive that is common. And contractually, uh, there, would, there would need to be an agreement between the two property owners on how that driveway got, gets maintained and when it gets maintained. And would that be part of a, it would follow the property as a deed? That's correct. Okay. Restriction. Okay. You know, if I may uh, chime in, um, and perhaps this is a good uh, opportunity for me to um, uh, provide you uh, a similar uh, documentation. Um, the first point I would make to you is, as Mr. Walker uh, notes, 75, per, uh, 75 feet is common. The balance is separate. So we would separate this, uh, that the driveway uh, being uh, separate if uh, the board was to approve this uh, we're only dealing with 75 feet of common area to be commonly maintained each property owner would have the right uh, to maintain it in its entirety and likewise the obligation would be shared as far as the expense we don't are, are you talking about plan a or plan b um well if plan a if we went with sh what's shown the uh, lots are substantially on their own i'm sorry the driveways are substantially on their own lots but if you went with plan B, we would make the driveway for the larger lot uh, ex an exclusive driveway easement so that the larger lot would have the sole obligation to maintain that, you know, the longer part of the driveway because it only services their home. The commonality of maintenance would only be uh, as relates to the 75 foot portion up in the front. Otherwise, it would be separate obligations yes. and, okay. and maintenance. So, so the, uh, just so I can make clear in my own mind, I'm sorry. The if we're looking at B, which is the more the more extensive property line, not down the middle of the road, uh, you're saying you would have an agreement that follows the property that would stipulate who's responsible for what relative to driveway maintenance. Correct. And the way we would divide it is that the first 75 feet would be common, and then where the driveway branches off uh, for either lot individually, that would be exclusive maintenance okay. obligation on that lot. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, I would like to hand something up. I did submit it to your board professionals in advance. Now, uh, I was before this board back in 20, uh, 2002 on basically the very same application. So I have a certification <laughs> which I prepared, which just attaches documents, including a resolution of this board, uh, and likewise, uh, aerial photograph of the property uh, located at 198 Mendham Road here in uh, Morris Township. And in essence, uh, the board at that time and I realize everything changes, every application is judged on its own merits. So please, I'm not submitting this for the sake of saying, hey, listen, 21 years ago when I had no gray hair and I sat before this board and Brian Burns was here and Adrian Humbert was here, <laughs> that, uh, God rest his soul, the, uh, the board approved this. But I think what's, what's helpful is the fact that in conjunction with this application uh, back in 2002, uh, there was a uh, uh, driveway easement 
maintenance, was common driveway, underground utilities, very similar. It's actually the last attachment on this. So if I can take the liberty of just marking this as A5 and give it for informational purposes, not uh, starry decisis. So I'm just going to hand this up. I'll mark it as A5. And then you can just take a look at it. It's so telling as far as the, the comparableness to what we have here. And I don't want to steal your attorney's thunder, but it's not binding on you. It's just illustrative. So I'm going to hand those there. Did I steal your thunder? Uh, you, your ventriloquy was just <laughs> fine. And uh, well, we do get extra stare decisis for the Latin. Yeah, so, you know, that's, I always try to work that's Latin how that works. Yeah. You guys are killing a lot of trees tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're losing three points on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Any tree from out of state. Exactly. Someone weighs a pound. Wow. Where there's mass, there must be merit. So, so A5, just simply, uh, probably the best thing to take a look at is the uh, aerial photograph that's attached uh, to exhibit uh, A5. And it is, uh, again, an aerial photograph provided by the Morris County Planning Board, it uh, attaches Exhibit uh, D on A5. And uh, as you can see that, there was a yeah. pond up in the front of the property that kind of necessitated uh, manipulation of the lot line. And both houses on the, on the two uh, properties uh, are accessed by a common driveway. And there is a recorded easement. As I noted in the certification, it was a kind of an unusual set of facts. It started out... Uh, with a house and a barn. Somewhere along the line, a prior owner illegally converted the barn into a house. Uh, there was an application to the zoning board to allow two houses on the property that was denied. And then an application to this board was submitted in order to uh, transform what was a barn slash house into a standard house with a, uh, a common driveway easement and the like. So in essence, um, you can see how something like this has been effectuated the last uh, document attached to that is the underground easement and the like. And I remember Brian Burns marked it up extensively, so I consider it one of my better works because he had a heavy hand on its preparation, so much so that I've used it as a form to date. So it seems to have worked for the last 20 years. We haven't had any issues. And um, so should the board approve this application, we would utilize the very same language that places the obligation, common maintenance only for the first 75 feet. After that, everybody maintains their own. Thank you. Are you good, Ms. Murphy? Yes, and actually, I wasn't on the board then, but almost I was on the board. <laughs> <laughs> Any question, Mr. Benoit? Yes, quick question on the disturbance. Is smoke disturbance? Did you talk about the nature of the disturbance? Is it just leveling it off for the yards, or there's a wall? Like, yeah, so you know? we have, um, let's see. Uh, So we have um, we have a driveway the way this particular layout shown uh, because of the slope coming off from the top of the hill we utilize uh, the slope to have a garage under and get the driveway relating to the grade as much as possible on that side but there's still a little bit of fill uh, that's required in the fill so we're not cutting into that slope we're filling onto that particular slope. And then at the base of the slope, we have a proposed retaining wall, which stops the uh, stops the grading, uh, you know, in a in a formal in a formal manner. So um, the slopes are actually being filled and supported with a retaining wall. So the potential for and and the slopes are all graded uh, at a three to one slope, which is the requirement of the municipality um, and the retaining wall uh, prevents any disturbance uh, below that. I see, because the entrance to the drive for the garage cut is from the east. Your time is up, Mr. Benmore. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you're, you're leveling things off so you can, and you, you have a wall to hold up what's going on. And just to follow up to Ms. Murphy's comment, so you're still going to keep the two driveways, even if it's on one lot. You're still going to have them separated by Correct. the stones or whatever you're going to do. Correct. That, so that, two, that, two that, keep, that keeps the peace. Yes. Right? Right. Um, okay, great. That's, that's all I have. Mr. Barrett. All right. No questions. No questions. Mr. 
I, I'm just a point of clarification on uh, Mr. Benoit's uh, concern or, or issues just uh, about the slope disturbance. Uh, our ordinance does allow for disturbance of uh, steep slopes. There's a certain exemption for uh, utilities and driveways. And the majority of this disturbance is in the uh, uh, area that were related to the driveway you know, and, and utilities. So just something for the board to be aware of. Thank you for the clarification. Ms. Mayor. The only question, a little follow up um, on the so the only thing dividing the driveways in the middle after the first 75 feet are just the stones and three, gravel. Yeah, and they, three, three foot wide of stone. Three foot wide. So they can at any time decide they want to put something else in there, too. Correct. Correct. They have to leave right. the stones all the way up. So, and then the first house can only go in and out on their driveway. I mean, technically. Uh, well, it, it's for that right, lot, they, first 75 feet is common. So, right. Yeah. Right. But the only thing dividing them is the stones. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, well, just committee in this year. But thank you anyway. Uh, just a quick clarification. So on on the third sheet, and this goes back to what Ms. Murphy was saying, um, where the where the property is a little bit more balanced, the uh, the driveway where after the seventy five feet where it splits off to the um, it's on it's on clearly all on one the eight. 0.01 property, but there would be a uh, an easement or some kind of deed restriction that says that that part of the this this block and lot does not is is maintained by the other property owner. Right. So once the driveway is split off, each property owner is responsible for their own driveway, even though it's on the property of Correct. the other resident. Correct. And that's that would be clear to both homeowners. Yes, it would. Now, what okay. we could do is we could make the uh, driveway for the larger lot uh, once it splits and still remains on the front lot. Uh, we can make that an exclusive easement that the the uh, larger lot would have only the exclusive right to use that. So there'd be no question as to whose obligation it was to maintain it. Likewise, uh, whose right it was to use it. I, I think that that would be a good a good approach to this. Yeah, and and the beauty of this is that uh, it creates a lot less disturbance, uh, and likewise, uh, it respects the environmental uh, limitations of the area to the north. So these areas are have been found by the DEP beyond the driveways uh, to be wetlands and transition areas. So those are going to be remaining undisturbed. So it's not as though uh, somebody's going to have an opportunity to go put a, a basketball court or do any, that area primarily is going to remain just the way it is because it is environmentally uh, restricted by the DEP. Okay. Uh, other question, and this I guess is a two-part question. Uh, plowing would be the responsibility of the homeowners and garbage pickup would still be on Starlight Drive. So the homeowners would have to wheel their garbage down Looks like a few hundred feet. Correct. Okay. Um, the only other question, the only other comment that I had is it sure would be nice if this was all electric instead of natural gas. Just saying. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Chief? No question. Ms. Van Order? Future. Just as a point of clarification, because a lot of the drawings I'm looking at say that the um, the tennis court will remain, but you've stated the tennis court will not remain, and that was part of your negotiations with the DEP or with their requirement, uh, from what my understanding. Correct. So, it, where I see the places on the plans that say tennis court will remain, oh, yeah, just ignore that. Yeah, yeah, okay. thank you. That's a yeah, that's a typo. We'll, we'll remove that. Flowers, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Walker, on the first sheet, there's uh, where was this? There's a shed that's shown on the property line between the applicant's property and lot seven. Who does that belong to? That I believe that shed goes with the subject property. Okay. Is that really still there? Because some of this other stuff that's you know said that it's existing dwelling, there's really not much. Right. I mean, I guess there's like no, a there was a fire chimney yeah. or a, yeah. Yep. So is that shed still there? Is that going to get you the answer from somebody that knows? So, you got a guy? <laughs> while I didn't anticipate calling Mr. Savage, Mr. Savage is here. He's intimately familiar with the property. He's got the ticks to prove it. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah. I'm going to ask that Mr. Savage be uh, sworn, and then he can address any questions that you have about existing conditions. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Please raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear to God or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. And again, name and address for the record, although we could probably glean both. But Joe Savage, 28 Stonehenge Road, Morristown, Morris Township. Morris 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 all right, good. Mr. Savage, there was a question posed by one of the board members, Mr. Flowers, as to the shed that's uh, shown as being over the property line. That is the neighbor's. That's not ours. Oh, okay. So what's going to, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter for us, but it looks like it's mostly on your property. It is. is. I've spoken to the neighbor about it. It didn't bother us, so we okay. told him he could leave it there. Right. If it was an issue with the town, I could bring it up to him, but yeah, we, not we a problem yet. Okay. All right. I, excuse me. Yeah. I would just note that if it's left there a long time, it becomes an adverse possession situation. I would be cautious about that. Okay. That's a good point. I don't know how long it's been there. That I can't tell you. You discuss that with your attorney afterwards. Yep. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't bother you, don't bother the name. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all. Very good. I have a couple of questions. Are we going to get a list of the variances? Okay. One. Second question I have is actually for our professional, Mr. Warner. So they prevent, pre, pre, presented us with two options. Is it common that we make the decision which option they go with, or are they going to present an option they want and we're going to vote on it? The answer is yes and yes, because te technically the applicant should uh, uh, put forth what they want uh, in front of you, and that's what they're asking for. That's their application. However, it's not uncommon to for applicants to say, you know, if the board would prefer Y over X, you know, we're happy to do it. And so then it sort of puts it, to, uh, it, it in your in your court. Uh, frankly, I think we might have some other professionals that may want to give their opinion with respect to which may which option the board may find preferable. So uh, by way of uh, uh, preview. Um, also, with respect to the 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 um, getting the variances, aside from the fact that which option is going to impact the magnitude and number of lot width variances, we are still away. Uh, we should have that answer, and we, and then uh, we should figure out what those lot width deviations are. I think they're on the plan already, with respect to the option. That is the proposed subdivision exhibit page two of three in exhibit uh, lost track here, A2. Um, and, and maybe it's a good, what, here's your preview. Segue to, to, I to Mr. Provide Phillips. provide you with what I believe, based on the interpretation of the ordinance definition of lot width that we discussed, the uh, lot width variances that would be needed for lot 801, each of the three instances is deficient. It's on, actually on the plans. And under footnote four, and for lot 802, there would be one deficiency, which would be at the front lot line. That would be 80 feet, where 100 feet is required. They meet it at the other two points. So those would be the variances. And, and, and would the slopes be considered variances? The no, slopes are a design, design waiver. Slightly different standards, 51 via the MOUL. If I can ask four questions, <laughs> out of order, but uh, it's it's thirty two. Can you give us those three numbers for uh, proposed lot eight hundred one under the proposed subdivision as opposed to the alternative? Yes, at for lot eight hundred one at the front lot line, it's thirty two feet, and one hundred feet is required in all instances. Mm -hmm. At the minimum building setback line, which is 50 feet in the zone, it's 39.6 feet. And 40 feet beyond the 50 foot minimum setback line, it's 27.2 feet. So in all three technical instances, there's a deficiency. On a lot 802, the only deficiency is at the front lot line, it's 80 feet in lieu of 100 feet. And again, that's for the plan, not the alternative plan. I don't know if we have calcs for that, but this I is for the plan. Okay. Well, before we get into those calcs, uh, uh, and those are, we've treated those historically as uh, three, excuse me, now four variances, uh, quote unquote, technically. If you ask me to define what is a technical variance, but uh, as opposed to a variance, 
the answer is there's no difference, but they, they, at least in my opinion. Um, Are you going to define stare decisis for us? Uh, that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's not, no, stare decisis would be precedent. Not here, though, in my answer score. No precedent. Um, we, they are, uh, I don't know if I quote one of our board professionals that not both might have a preference as to which alternative and why that might be helpful for the, or is it premature? You want to go first? Sure. I mean, my preference would be the, uh, the first option that's in the plan set. I think it's cleaner from a, uh, you know, like a maintenance and, uh, and a lot line perspective. That's the property line right down sort of the middle of the driveway? Correct. Which, or, that's two separate yeah, I'm referencing that as A. Mr. Warren, just to refresh the board, when what we've called A and B, A is the lot line down the driveway, that creates a lot size variance? Not no, a lot, lot size. size. No, not size. What, what's the issue? Lot, lot width. width. Lot width. width. At Three different points for a proposed lot 801, and at there's also a, a deficiency at the front at one point for proposed lot 802. In that scenario, uh, that's the proposed subdivision. That's page two of exhibit A2, and those are the, 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 the deviations, the magnitude of the variances are those points that uh, uh, Paul just read earlier. Uh, 32 feet versus 100 feet. 39.6 feet at the front yard setback and 27.2 feet at the 40 foot beyond the setback for what proposed lot 801 and 80 feet at the frontage for proposed lot 802 all versus 100 feet minimum required. Mr. I'll just weigh, I, I would concur with Jim on my preference and what I'll say is while the alternative B is sort of better from a physical perspective. Uh, it, it basically is a more regularly shaped lot. My concern, I think, that I share with Jim is that because the access to the second lot is completely dependent on the first lot, if there's ever some kind of maintenance issue or something, that second lot's not going to be able to potentially have access. And the only other thing, and I think the applicant's engineer is doing the calcs, but it's not going to totally eliminate the lot width variances, correct? No, it's actually for the yeah. for option B, all three dimensions for both lots are non-compliant. Yeah, so you'd so have six variances. variances. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's right. So the alternative A actually has less relief being sought. Thank you. So, so Mr. Warner, procedurally, how do we move forward with A, B? Do we throw it back to the applicant to... Tell us what they want, or do we take a straw poll of the board members? Is it appropriate the, to do it the now? Can, the applicant can. Uh, I've never had an A and B before. <laughs> <laughs> There's no required per, uh, procedure. Uh, is the applicant uh, putting forth one, the other, or both? What are, what's well, the applicant? You know, the beauty I, I see in the planning process is that we get input from the board. And, you know, unlike the Zoning Board of Adjustment where you're pursuing like a use variance, everything is stoic until you know, there's a vote. Uh, with the Planning Board, there's more give and take. So we would like to get your input on the topic to see which, you know, is preferable. And we can certainly uh, attempt to accommodate concerns as, as, as they're vo voiced. So, Mr. Warner, we'd be willing to do that. The question is, is it done now? You, you Obviously, this is not going to determine whether we're going to approve the application. It's just giving advice to the applicant as to which lot line layout they should propose you you know what you can do it now but maybe at this point it makes more sense uh, since you've gotten the flavor of each you've got input from your own board professionals as to each maybe we should continue with the case there's more to hear and, and it only it only comes into play if there's going to be an approval uh, as to which uh, is the preferable so I have one other question. What, what is the height of the retaining wall? Well, it's just conceptual, right? So depending on... I'm just wondering whether there's structural engineering involved. No, there's no structural engineering. Under four feet? No. I don't know, uh, Mr. Slate, I don't know what triggers structural engineering. I think above four, four, four feet. The wall is, uh, the max height is four feet. Yeah. The way we have it shown. Thank you, Mr. Walker. 
And if it's if it's more than four feet in front of the structure, it triggers on the barrier. Right. Okay. I'm going to turn the uh, questioning over to our attorney, uh, for, uh, Mr. Warren. The uh, what's well, we got we got the magnitudes. Bear with me. We would agree that it would be no more than four feet. Yeah, it'll be a stipulation if approval is granted. We stipulate yes. Okay, got it. Uh, bear with me. Uh, here we go. We got. I think you'll stipulate to compliance with the tree removal and replacement ordinance, correct? Correct. Uh, soil erosion, sediment control, curb, Morris County <clears throat> Soil Conservation District. Stipulated? Yes. Correct. Uh, the. Uh, uh, you already stick the ca uh, camera in the existing sanitary sewer line and also the three foot. A stone shoulder depth of help me out again that's two foot depth plus plus a, a wick that's what i thought you said yeah so and a wick is for the uh, benefit of the board and maybe even the board attorney right so well a lot of times especially in these parts of new jersey you get the upper layer of the soil could be a little sticky and doesn't percolate that well so we could dig a, like a one foot wick that goes through that sticky layer into the better drained uh, soils down below Gotcha. It's some extra depth. Okay. Um, you uh, you stick to the deed restrictions with respect to the seventy-five foot portion of the common driveway, so that uh, and the agreements uh, be recorded uh, as per uh, the two thousand two sample. That is not a story decisis. Uh, the uh, tennis court will not remain. That's clear, and, and all plan revisions will be made uh, to clarify same. Uh, and the retaining wall will not be greater than four feet. So those are the steps to date. Uh, and and uh, we, uh, the planning memo of April 4, the TCC memo, no trees removed along the driveway connection from Starlight, correct? Mm -hmm. Or not correct. Would you repeat that, please? A any trees being removed along the driveway connection from Starlight Drive? So that was a uh, point of clarification, and she's uh, two of six addressed that issue. They're showing those trees yeah, show that are going to be removed. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so some are. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. uh, fire department is good, and. Environmental Commission had a lot of recommendations in their, well, I have an April 5, 2021 memo that resurfaced April 22, 2024. Um, did you address those? You know, there was a comment contained in the memo with regard to the uh, stream embankment. Uh, it had something to do with roots uh, protruding out of the embankment. Uh, as you may imagine, that's a regulated feature. Uh, there was some discussions during the TCC meeting about granting an additional easement to the municipality for stream maintenance. It serves as a uh, conduit of stormwater from some 170 acres. As uh, for those of you, I'm sure you've been to the property, there's some very large uh, pipes coming out from underneath Starlight Drive that discharge into this area, and it carries a lot of water. And certainly if the municipality requires some easement or other type of authority to supplement, modify, enhance uh, the stream, certainly will grant that uh, as, as it relates to actually doing work down there. I mean, I, I think the last thing you would want to do is have somebody other than the municipality go in there and start uh, modifying a stormwater uh, feature that carries such amount of volume for the benefit of the township. So we would agree that we would provide the necessary easement or other authorization uh, i.e. like a permit authorization to the DEP if necessary uh, as the town would see fit, township sees fit. But as far as actually going in there and, uh, you know, cutting roots out of the, <laughs> the bank, I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> so that was the one item that came up. Uh, there was also the request to utilize green infrastructure with regard to the house to the uh, greatest degree possible and within financial feasibility. Uh, if it's under our ability, we'll do that. Now, there's uh, certain things we can do, certain things we can't do because it just drives prices to the point where it's not feasible. But certainly if there's things we could do with regard to stormwater management to address concerns uh, and otherwise in the infrastructure, 
uh, we can certainly accommodate that. Everything will be built under the current uh, building code. And I know there are requirements uh, that have been incorporated into the current code relative to uh, energy efficiency and, and construction uh, requirements. So whatever the code requires, we'll, we'll comply with. May, may I make a comment? Of course. Excuse me. So uh, in that same environmental letter that you're referring to, the item below the comment on the stream, there was also a comment on an existing sanitary sewer pipe, which is exposed and needs to be stabilized. That doesn't, that seems that that might be an issue for the township. Yeah, I believe that's a township. I'm glad you picked up on that because I, I did catch that as well. There is a, a municipal sewer easement that traverses the property. Yeah. And I believe that is a municipal, uh, perhaps a trunk line. That would be my guess. Too, and, so. uh, you know, the thing is, once again, uh, that falls outside of our uh, purview. It's the township's uh, line. So certainly if the township requires some type of authorization or some other type of uh, easement, uh, we're happy to grant whatever it is that the township would require as it relates to their pipe. If it's our pipe, we'll take care of it. But well, I think it, it's yeah, it looks like it's a township pipe. So I would say the township probably should take care of it. And then there's two, exi two, two existing demolition debris piles should be removed and debris disposed of in the appropriate manner. Agreed. And uh, Native, uh, species native, native species. Correct. We'll do that. Okay. And uh, then obviously you'll have to comply with the Southeast Mars County Municipal Utilities Authority's uh, water meter and other requirements in their May 23, 2024. Yes, we reviewed it and we know the conditions and we'll comply. And uh, that's when we got the lot with. Nothing further right now. Thank Just you. One more sure. question for you, Mr. Warner. What happens if the DEP permit is not issued? Well, it's going to be a condition of approval. So if it's not issued, they're going to have to comply. They're going to have to find a, a, an alternative or come back to the board. I would assume. Yeah. I, I would say the chances of that happening, or even in today's climate, is next to nil in light of the fact that it's a general permit. It's basically a permit as of right. And the DEP has extracted um, conditions that they otherwise really don't have a regulator regulatory right to extract. But that being said, <laughs> we, we have capitulated with all of their demands. Uh, and the chief of the land use section has given us personal assurance. I've known the man for over 20 years. And any time that he gives me a personal assurance, and Mr. Walker as well, he's never reneged. So um, I don't see there being any... Uh, possibility that that would happen right but mr warner's told us what yeah yeah there would be no subject we'd have thank to you. modify something or you another question? yeah just a point of clarification thank you um regarding the 50 some odd trees that you're taking down and replacing with 140 some odd trees i believe um that is going to be the responsibility of the developer and not passed along to the homeowner is that correct there would be an accommodation uh, it, it, first, we'd have to make it known. Secondly, as far as actually installing the trees, you don't want to install the trees prior to construction or even during the midst of construction. You would want to have the grades finished. I mean, even when you take a look at where Mr. Walker is providing that retaining wall on the large lot, uh, there is uh, trees that are being removed because the grade is being modified. So once the grade has been modified, then we can install the trees. Now, as relates to the actual cost, the, the ultimate cost bearing this is going to be on the developer because that's what it's built into the price or built into the into the overall product but ultimately who plants those trees most likely it's going to be the homeowner because they're going to be able to select where they want to put them uh, the variety I mean there are a number of native species that they could choose from but we'll work it in so that they would have a say as to what type of trees where they want to plant them etc now there's only going to be so many trees you can plant for those of you I'm sure you're familiar with the property it's that the canopy is very high. I mean, it's like maybe an 80 foot canopy. And there's only so, so many trees you can plant under a canopy that are going to thrive. So I would imagine there's going to be a substantial likelihood that there'll be a payment in lieu for many of these trees because it's just, it's with as, as, as it's just dark under there as, as it is at, you know, 
at midnight because you, know, you have such such a high count. I think that's kind of where I was going with this: yeah. is who's going to bear that burden, the homeowner or the developer? Yeah. Well, and and is it known by? Well, will it be known by each party what their responsibilities are? What we can do is we can include a deed notice in the subdivision deed that places in the chain of title the obligation to comply with the tree uh, replacement ordinance so that it comes as no surprise. And then as a result, it'll be spelled out. And we could certainly make that subject to the review and approval of the board attorney so that there'd be language in there that places you know, the public or whoever's in the chain of title on notice as to this obligation. Thank you. I think that'll work. Got this. Mr. Uh, I have no interest in maintaining this screen, but uh, I would uh, like an easement if the uh, applicant's willing to grant it, assuming again there's approval. Uh, there, where the storm sewer discharges, there's a number of pipes, and uh, that's something that's on our list to uh, consolidate that into one uh, discharge point. So uh, I would say an easement in order to encompass, you know, all those storm sewer pipes, you know, uh, you know, relatively small. I'm going to say 25 by, you know, 25, something along those lines. Uh, should the board approve the application, uh, Mr. Slate, if he would be so kind as to provide us a hand-drafted sketch as to what he's looking for, Mr. Walker's office can prepare a meets and bounds description with a plat, and we can incorporate that into a general stormwater easement or sewer easement or utility easement as may be found acceptable to the municipality. Does that work for you, Mr. Warren? Very good. We're going to open up the uh, questioning of Mr. Walker to the public. So if uh, anyone out there is looking to ask a question of the civil engineer only, please come to the uh, lectern, state your name and address clearly, and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> good evening. My name is Paul Hallis. My address is Seven Fieldstone Drive in Morris Township, and my property is one of the ones that abut the uh, the project. Um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to just quickly comment that I have no conceptual issue or objection to this essentially two lot subdivision, but I do have some questions for the applicant's professional with respect to some of the details in the plan. Um, looking at page two of the, I'm not sure what exhibit number it is. It was the uh, series of subdivision maps and plats and drawings that were provided. It's the one called tree removal. Um, my first question concerns uh, the location of the new plantings. If you look at this map, it appears that uh, most of the new plantings, if not, you know, more than 90% of them, are concentrated in the area of the former tennis court. My question is whether or not any consideration was given to uh, replacing some of the removed trees to the property line uh, that backs the new lots in order to provide some privacy between uh, the new construction and the existing homes. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So these are just conceptual dwellings. We didn't do a conceptual tree planting plan. The trees where the tennis court are was, was dictated to us by the DEP because it's within that wetland buffer area. So we haven't, we have not tried to address the tree removal in this plan uh, as the lot is a lot development plan comes forward. We know exactly what it is, who the property owners are. Uh, a tree planting plan will be developed at that time. Okay, so in the future, there will be some opportunity for neighboring property owners to provide input or at least our comment on uh, placement. Uh, let, let me offer this to address the gentleman's comment. Um, we would offer as a condition of approval that should the board approve the application that we would work with the board planner to uh, include some uh, plantings along the property line, which the gentleman is speaking of. Uh, in order to address concern about screening. Now, whether uh, you're, I'm not sure whether your ordinance permits uh, evergreens or it all has to be deciduous, but uh, we would certainly work with your board professional in order to address that concern so that prior to signing of any plans, there would be something shown along that property line in order to address the neighbor's concern. I would appreciate that. And, and if I may, before you proceed, because I was going to uh, thank you for offering that stipulation, I was about to 
ask for it. Can we get a just a brief description of the property line we're talking about so that the resolution sure. reflects it adequately? It's actually the uh, southerly property line of the existing lot. So it butts up to uh, actually, actually the south, southwesterly property line. Uh, the south line and the southwestern property line. So, uh, really, the lots in question from the neighborhood would be uh, probably lots two, three, four, six, and seven that uh, run up to the subject property. That would that would have any impact at all from this this development. If you look on the key map, I'm seeing good. Seven and seven hundred one. Seven hundred one. Yeah. Seven and seven hundred one. Those are lots. If you look Three. on the key map of sheet one of our plan set, oh, uh, that's consistent with the tax map. Oh. So, yeah, lots two, three, four, six, and seven. That's those lots are butting up to where the proposed homes seven. would be constructed. May I proceed? Thank you. Yeah. A couple of additional questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, with respect to the, the nature of the lot itself, uh, it was severely impacted by Sandy, and there are a number of dead and leaning trees. Does the tree removal plan that's part of this application take into account any um, intention to remove dead or leaning trees? All right, so here's the, here's the answer. In the wetlands or the wetland buffer, the DEP does not want you to remove dead trees from the wetlands or the transition areas. Okay. These would be along the back property line that, that you just described. But if it's within our legal area of development, obviously to make the lots nicer uh, and you know usable, most all those dead trees will be removed unless they're in the transition area. We, we could agree to remove any dead or leaning trees, which I would assume if they're leaning, they're probably dead, uh, that are outside a regulatory area. Thank you. Um, question concerning the plans for electrical utilities from Starlight. I assume that's where the electric is going to come onto the property. Is it going to be underground or overhead? It's going to be underground. There's a utility pole that actually encroaches into the property. So from that pole, we'll run the electric down and the underground. Okay. Uh, just one or two more additional questions, and I'm referring to uh, the drawing number three in the package. Uh, and specifically, my question concerns the plans for sewage uh, removal. It appears that the new dwelling to the, I'm going to call it to the left here, if you're looking at this map, is going to have a, a forced main and a pump that brings sewage back out to Starlight. Is that correct? Yeah, the way our concept plan worked out was the sewer in the basement. We needed, we were going to put in a low pressure uh, pump, which is in, called the environmental one. It's the preferred manufacturer for, for something like that. Uh, so there's a, a line that's constructed. Um, so it, it's really a unique setup where there's a low pressure setup in the in the pump, and there's always effluent in the line. And every time there's water that runs through the system, the pump kicks on and it pumps the column and that's going on. So it's not a, like a dynamic pumping situation. It's kind of like a snail pumping type of situation. Uh, so it's a nice system for a single family home. And uh, we prefer to use that kind of system because it's really easy to service. The pump system's outside. If you ever have a problem with your pump, they open the chamber, they pull the pump cylinder out and they just put a new one in take the old one back to the shop and fix it. So that's the kind of system that we were thinking of putting in you know, uh, for that area. And the, the, it's a, from a layman's perspective, it seems like a pretty long run for this uh, pump to reach back out to Starlight for, for sewage. I assume that it's all specced out to cover that length. Yeah, and, absolutely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my bigger concern is with respect to the plants for sewage for the the dwelling unit that's on the right hand side of the map it appears it's going to connect into an existing sewage line that previously serviced the existing dwelling on the property 
many, many years ago. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. <clears throat> Has anything been done to ensure that that sewage line, and I know there was a request that it be cameraed, uh, and I'm not sure that made it to a stipulation in the proposed um, uh, memorandum of resolution, but uh, I would like that to be a stipulation that you're going to um, camera that and make sure that it's capable. I don't know if over years there's been roots growing in there or that um, there's any other um, way that gets impeded. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll make sure that that's fully functional. Okay. So it's clear we will accept the Mr. Slate's recommendation right. as a uh, condition. Yeah, and that that'll all be subject to his and the engineering department's review and approvals, which should help. I'm sorry, which will help. When was the last time that that sewage line had was used for any uh, you know, for its intended purpose? Do you know? I do not. Um, and you can't see from the map here where that leads to. Can you do you know? Where that heads out to? Uh, well, it heads out to the uh, the easement that's in the in the back to the north uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the east. Okay. Do you know how how uh, deep that sewage line is is buried? We have not done any studies on it, so that's going to be part of our when we go for a building permit. That will be one of the requirements. That we make sure that that line works properly or it'll have to be replaced in time. Okay. I mean, my concern is as a downhill property owner that if there is a failure there, if it's close to the surface, we may be encountering materials that we'd rather not see. No, good point. Right. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Anyone else in the public have any questions? Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Sharif Fahmy. Um, I'm at 33 Starlight Drive, which is directly across the driveway that we've been talking about tonight. Um, so my questions um, are all about storm drainage, because I've lived at this property for 27 years, and I've been encountering one lake after another right in front of my property. The existing drains can't handle the water coming down from the street, coming from my backyard through the easement pipe into across the street into the stream. I'm going to ask you to bear with me one second, if you would. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilor, do you have any objection to me swearing this gentleman in so that the testimony he's providing uh, can... Uh, I have no objection. Uh, ...be considered by the board? Thank you. And this, this is the time for questioning. I recognize every question requires a little predicate yes. comment. So uh, if, if you don't mind raising your right hand, I'll swear you in. Do you swear to God or affirm that the testimony you've already given in any further testimony that you may give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please continue asking your question. Okay. So um, I mentioned about the challenges that are currently exist, right, with storm drainage. My concern is I've heard about tree removal right off of Starlight Drive. Right, right next to the driveway. That can't help that situation. Uh, I'm concerned about the slope of the existing driveway, the slope of the proposed driveway, right? And the total impact of the construction on the storm drainage. I understand that there's been um, an environmental review and a pending approval, um, but I've never heard anybody come and ask me about what my situation is and what I've seen. So I assume some people know what they're doing, but um, it doesn't negate my concern about widening the driveway, having heavy vehicles go in and out, and the removal of not just the trees in front of my house, which definitely do some storm mitigation, but there's water that are, you know, that is just piling up all in the front. So I would, I would hope that this is an opportunity to help mitigate some of that water that is happening in that area because it's going to touch the proposed driveway right so the the applicants i'm not sure if you're going to be living there or not but you're going to have to drive through a little bit of a lake to get out to starlight so that's basically my question i'm sorry if it was no, elongated no i just just so the board understands so your 
we're looking at the exhibit, which is the uh, exhibit two, which is sheet one. Um, so the gentleman's property is on the inside corner uh, of Star Lake Drive, across from the subject property, right? So our property slopes away from Starlight Drive. So, you know, I, I understand that you're having some uh, existing condition problems, right? Um, for our application, as soon as we leave Starlight Drive, our driveway is headed downhill away from your property, and the slope of the driveway is 3.22%. So you've got a relatively flat driveway going away from Starlight Drive. Uh, there is a lot of drainage that from Starlight Drive, and there's a couple of uh, a couple of 15-inch pipes that look like they run through your property yes. towards that storm drain. So there's a combination of probably three inputs coming into that one storm drain, and I would imagine under an intense rainstorm, storm drain can't handle it, and the water backs up. That is correct. That's what's happening. That is correct. Right. So my concern is, I mean, I, I don't understand why any trees would be need to re, be removed from there. because that We are actually not removing on our plan, which is sheet two of six. The first trees that we're showing to be removed are about 100 feet away from Starlight Drive. So we're already, you know, four feet lower. So not frontage of Starlight Drive in the back. Like, as you go down the common driveway, you're taking those trees, yes. not the trees in the front in the driveway. Not in the front. We're following the existing driveway. Okay. So our driveway is really narrow in the front, and then it widens out uh, to about 22 feet wide when you get 75 feet away from the road. So hmm. we're already way downhill and far away from the near property. So all the drainage from our site is not going to impact you. It's going to drain away from your property. But I understand your concerns maybe should be voiced with the DPW and uh, fixing an existing issue that's out there. Yes, you're right. It is an existing issue. And my concern is, like, there's been a lot of slope discussion um, today. And I'm just concerned about any changes in the topography of that area, whether it be the 75 feet or beyond, right, that will cause any kind of additional, um, you know, matter to come my way. Understood. Yeah. And, and we're draining away from you, so we will not be adding any more water to those storage. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Hi, Andres Benvenuto, 11 Fieldstone Drive. I'm sorry, can you spell your last name? Benvenuto, B-E-N-V-E-N-U-T-O. A couple of quick questions. Um, when we think about the uh, the retaining wall on the north side of the property, have you ever considered doing a more of a natural berm instead of a hard, you know, structure such as a retaining wall? Well, there's a slope. I mean, it's just conceptual. Yeah. Like, it could completely go away depending on who decides to build what type of house on that particular lot? So it's just merely conceptual. Okay. But the limit of disturbance is most likely going to, going to remain. Okay. That's and a, that's the area where we're going to go. Yeah. Yeah, that, that seems, yeah, it's a lot of disturbance in that in that area. And uh, I'm just concerned about just downstream potential accelerating flooding towards Fieldstone right. and, and beyond. That's where soil erosion comes in. Yeah. It's very important. You have to get a soil erosion permit. And you have to pay to have them come out, do inspections on the property. Uh, they have the ability to shut the project down. Okay. During construction. So it has to be, and they have to certify to our plan that it's stable before a CO is issued. They actually have a lot of power. Okay. Good, thank you. And then uh, just thinking about the emergency turnaround for the fire engines, et cetera, have you considered making that more of like a gravel, more of a natural state than impervious, you know, asphalt? 
Um, we gave the fire department what they wanted. Okay. Can I ask questions to the fire department now or not? <laughs> You're on. Maybe that's for another discussion, but what was the, what's the exact question? No, so the turnaround. Uh, I assume that's going to be an asphalt material, correct? Yes. yes. Is there any way to keep that more of a, a gravel, more natural than impervious I mean, we, we asphalt? We try to make it as you know aesthetics as possible with the driveway and stuff. But I mean, the, the any type of stabilized ground would be sufficient. But you know that was what was proposed. It looked, you know sufficient for for me and for what we were concerned about so okay. um yeah. i no... would say though too like if it's gravel the plow plows the gravel away and then you get the, all the finer particulates that run off from that driveway and find their way down mm -hmm. to the brook it's actually and it counts the same it's impervious cover whether it's yeah. gravel or whether it's pavement right uh, so in this particular instance and make sure that we have a nice, suitable, stable turnaround for emergency vehicles. Pavement probably makes more sense. Okay. And uh, just one more question. Has the applicant considered just developing one home instead of doing a subdivision of, of two? So a larger home, which kind of fits in that beautiful <laughs> uh, setting there, uh, instead of going through all this uh, you know, development, consider a larger home, you know, on that property instead of uh, two? Well, we're proposing to build houses that commensurate what's, what's in the neighborhood rather than having some type of palace that didn't commensurate. The lot is large enough and there's enough coverage on the property now, like with the tennis court and things like that, that we felt that it would be better to come in with a, a plan that showed the lots more in conformance with what the ordinance envisions in this R15 zone and likewise, homes that are commensurate rather than, I mean, when you get a giant house in a neighborhood of, say, 3,000 square foot colonials, it, it really doesn't um, fit in. So Counselor, you, do you have a planner that you've mentioned? Yes, we do. Yeah, we'll touch on that. But to, to answer your question briefly, it was considered and this was seen to be a better alternative. Okay. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the next witness, please. Thank you. Okay, very good. Mr. Walker will be here for the uh, balance of the presentation should questions arise. So our next witness is Nicholas Graviano. Mr. Graviano is a licensed professional planner. I'm going to ask that he come on up. He's already been sworn, so if he briefly state his credentials on the record, and then he can address the uh, planning aspects of tonight's presentation. Mr. Graviano, you have been sworn. If you would please state... Uh, your name and uh, business address, and then if you could put your educational uh, background and your experience on the record. Yes, my first name is Nicholas with an H, last name Graviano, G-R-A, V as in Victor, I-A-N-O. I am a planner and partner with Graviano and Gillis Architects and Planners with a business address of 101 Crawford's Corner Road in Holmdel, New Jersey. I hold a bachelor's degree from Rutgers University, a master's degree in city and regional planning from Rutgers University, a law degree from the Temple University School of Law, where I received a distinguished class performance in state and local government law. I've testified in over 100 municipalities in 18 different counties in the state of New Jersey. Uh, my New Jersey professional planner's license is valid, and I also hold an AICP certification. You're an acceptable witness. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, you, you heard extensive uh, details on this uh, application through the engineering testimony, which was very comprehensive. Uh, so I'm going to keep this uh, basic. The applicant is before you this evening requesting minor subdivision approval with associated C variances and design waivers for a specific piece of property known as Block 2301, Lot 8, with a street address of 34 Starlight Drive. Uh, that is in the RA15 district. Uh, the property's lot area, as you heard previously, is 5.466 acres. That's 238,117 square feet, whereas only 15,000 square feet is required for a lot in the zoning district. Uh, lot 8.01 uh, will encompass 30,073 square feet, whereas lot 8.02 will be 208,049 square feet. 
Uh, lot 8.01, uh, therefore, is two times the required minimum area of the RA 15 district, whereas lot 8.02 is 13.86 times the required minimum lot area of the district. Uh, as, as we've broken down uh, previously, uh, the applicant is requesting four variances for the same variance. We had this discussion earlier uh, for lot 8.01. It's requesting a front lot line width variance, whereas 32 feet is required. I mean, 32 feet is proposed, 100 feet is required. Uh, the lot width at the minimum setback, whereas 39.6 feet is proposed and 100 feet is required. And a variance is also required at the 40 foot mark beyond the front yard setback. Uh, moving on to lot 8.02. A lot with variance is required at the front lot line measurement, whereas 80 feet is proposed and 100 feet is required. Um, with the re relief being requested by the variance, it certainly could be granted under the C2 criteria, whereas it relates to a specific piece of property. Here you have a 5.466 acre parcel in the RA15 zone. Additionally, the applicant must demonstrate that the purposes of zoning would be advanced uh, by the granting of the deviation. And then lastly, the benefits of the deviation would outweigh any detriment uh, to the zone plan zoning ordinance or the community as a whole. Now, looking at the purposes of zoning and municipal land use law, this proposal certainly advances purpose A, to encourage municipal action to guide the appropriate use or development of lands in a manner which will promote the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. And you heard numerous reasons how this will be accomplished through the testimony before. Uh, the applicant has committed to the removal of dead and leaning trees in the vicinity of the neighboring property owners. Additionally, the applicant has committed to provide easement areas for the township's drainage utilities, um, providing easement areas for the benefit of the community as a whole, not just for the applicant. And then lastly, the applicant is reducing impervious coverage on the site with this application. Moving on, this proposal also advances purpose E to promote the establishment of appropriate population densities and concentrations that will contribute to the well-being of persons, neighborhoods, communities, and regions. Uh, this applicant is providing single-family dwellings on oversized lots in the RA15 district, which is certainly in keeping uh, with the appropriate population density uh, of the area. Additionally, the applicant advances purpose G to provide sufficient space and appropriate location for a variety of residential uses with their respective environmental requirements in order to meet the needs of New Jersey citizens. Uh, this somewhat ties in the purpose uh, E as well. Uh, the RA15 zone is appropriate location for two single family dwellings, two times and 13.86 times the minimum lot required for the, for the district. There's certainly no substantial impairment to the zone plan or zoning ordinance with the applicant's proposal. Uh, the applicant uh, has uh, received positive reviews on the driveway configuration from the fire official and is working towards satisfying the requirements of the NJDEP. Uh, the applicant's only re variance being requested this evening relates to the lot width. The applicant's proposed structures, the building footprints will meet all of the required setbacks of the RA15 zoning district and is certainly not uh, creating any substantial impairment to the, any, any of the surrounding neighbors. Uh, looking at the 2017 master plan re-examination, uh, this proposal certainly helps preserve the predominantly single family residential neighborhoods of the community. Additionally, it ensures that infill development in these neighborhoods are, are considerate of the context of surrounding homes. These are certainly homes that are befitting of the neighborhood and complement the existing community well. And then lastly, uh, through the applicant's uh, committal to helping the drainage easements and, and stormwater management maintenance of the community, uh, it helps advance the purpose in the 2017 master plan reexamination to continue to monitor and improve the stormwater management, uh, particularly of redevelopment and uh, development and redevelopment sites. So in conclusion, the variance can be granted under the C2 criteria advances advancing purposes of zoning A, E, and G, 
without substantial impairment to the zone plan or zoning ordinance or substantial impairment to the public good. Uh, Mr. Graviano, you mentioned that the areas where at the homes are proposed to be built are sufficiently large in order to uh, substantiate the homes in conformance with the pattern of development in the neighborhood. Now, you have an opportunity to review all the documents that were submitted. And uh, is it fair to say you're familiar with the environs in which this lot is located? Yes, I am. Okay, so now let's talk about what the route, because uh, ordinances generally have purposes, you know. And uh, can you tell us in your planning uh, expertise what the route of a lot width uh, criteria would be as it relates to the purpose? Why have a lot width criteria? What's the purpose of it? A lot, lot width criteria are done to, one, provide access to the dwellings as well as to you know, provide a, you know, continuity on, on the streetscape. Okay, so is it fair to say that one of the purposes of an ordinance that requires lot width is to provide for sufficient width on a lot in order to construct a house? That is correct. And it's also fair to say that based on this ordinance, uh, which the township has, that there are various degrees of measuring how wide the lot is from various points, that it's presumed that somewhere between point one and point three of the lot that's the required width that the house is going somewhere in there. Yes. Uh, the environmental constraints on this property certainly uh, necessitate a, a different lot width than what's prescribed by ordinance. But when you look at the building envelope or the proposed dwellings, it certainly provides adequate setbacks, light, air, and open space between the, the two proposed dwellings as well as to the neighboring dwellings. So my concern and my uh, question to you is that if somebody is proposing lots that are unusually narrow to the point where, say, the ordinance in this instance is 100 foot wide, and we're proposing lots that are, say, 40 feet wide, would it be fair to say I wouldn't be able to construct a house that's commensurate with the homes in this neighborhood? That's correct. Is it also fair to say that the purpose of the ordinance, to provide sufficient width where you could build a house and, and meet side yard setback, meet front yard setback, meet rear yard setback? So you got a wide enough area to put a house that that is met by placing the houses in this configuration that's proposed this evening. Yes, the applicant is certainly pro proposing a building envelope, which is consistent with the ordinance's intent. So is it fair to say that despite the fact that we don't meet the letter of the ordinance as relates to the, having the width prescribed in the ordinance, that we're meeting the intent of the ordinance by providing sufficient enough wide building areas where homes could be built of size commensurate with the neighborhood with sufficient area also for backyards, side yards, sufficient screening, sufficient place for uh, recreational activity you have on a house, maybe a swimming pool or uh, even a, a gazebo or a deck or something like that. That is correct. Okay, so based upon that, knowing that you have to meet both the positive and negative criteria, is it planning testimony that we satisfy that negative criteria as it relates to not having a substantial negative impact on the zone plan and the zone plan? I certainly see no detrimental effects to the applicant's proposal before the board this evening. All right, I don't have anything further. Just my conclusion. Yeah, well, conclude with Mr. Grabby. Okay, we're going to go to our board professionals first, Mr. Slate. No question. Mr. Phillips? I don't have any questions on the variance testimony. Any comments on the steep slope disturbance design waiver? You're leaving that to the engineer. I believe the engineer testified that the disturbance is only approximately 480 square feet and change over what's required by ordinance. I think there's adequate uh, engineering review to uh, ensure that uh, there'll be no detrimental effects from that slope disturbance waiver being granted. Okay. That's what I'm saying for last again. <laughs> hey. What's that saying? Who did they say for last now? The, 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 um... The, uh, if I could just follow up a little bit more on the uh, design waiver for the steep slopes under 51B of the municipal land use law, uh, is it your testimony that the engineer's testimony demonstrated that it's uh, impracticable uh, to require the uh, uh, applicant uh, to strictly comply with the uh, uh, steep slope disturbance maximums permitted in order to develop this lot for sing two single-family dwellings? 
I believe we heard an engineering testimony that were they were mainly related to access for the driveway and, and to the to the dwelling itself, which uh, the township's ordinance uh, gives allowances for. I guess what I'm saying is to the extent that deviations are required, uh, they're a necessity as a yes. result of this, uh, the way, uh, the way these lots are configured. Yes. I think we heard an engineer testimony that they were, uh, minimized to the greatest extent possible. And, and is it your, with respect to the first prong of the negative criteria for the lot with variances, uh, is it your opinion that these dwellings and these lots while somewhat unique the lots in their configuration are nevertheless not substantially out of character with the neighborhood no i think they're certainly in keeping with the established character of the neighborhood and can you just provide a little bit of the why as to that they they provide all of the proper setbacks to the uh, neighboring properties uh not as well as the applicants to proposed dwellings uh, the building envelopes are consistent with existing ho homes in the area. I had the uh, pleasure of being in this neighborhood twice, uh, once a week ago, uh, second time before the hearing this evening. And th these proposed dwellings are certainly in keeping with the established character of the neighborhood. I have nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, start the other side. Mr. Flowers. I have no questions. Stay in order. I have no questions. Chief Dunn? No questions, sir. Too many rabbits? No questions for the planner. Mayor? No questions. Barrett? Yes, Mr. Chair, I have one question. And, and, and this question is, isn't to suggest that the answer is dispositive of this issue about the width uh, of the, the, the lot size. But my question is, uh, do you know whether any of the properties in the surrounding areas received a variance, a width variance in terms of uh, lot sizes? I do not know that. I, I looked at this property on its on its merits alone in terms of the unique conditions of this specific piece of property. Um, in, in municipal land use law, if, if a large majority of homes in the neighborhood have the same condition, the, the pre prescriptive element is a zone change, not variances being granted by by the board this property itself exhibits unique conditions that warrant the granting of the variances okay fair enough thank you mr benoit uh, no questions mr murphy i have no questions of this witness mr warren do you have anything else you want to add nope we're done with your witness well yes. mr chair just to oh, sorry i'm mistake. any questions from the public for this witness yes sir could you just restate your name and address again? Sure. Good evening. My name is Paul Hallis, uh, Seven Field Stone Drive in Morris Township. Um, <clears throat> sir, is it within your purview to take into account parking and ingress and egress as a professional planner? Yes. Um, isn't it appropriate, or should I say, isn't it um, characteristic of this neighborhood uh, for there to be ample on-street parking for parties and festivities when people have, um, you know, events like that at their homes? The applicants meeting the required RSIS off-street parking requirements. Relief is not being requested. Uh, but what I'm saying is that there may be plenty of parking for the residents of the house, but in the event they had an event where there was overflow parking needed, could they park along the sides of this driveway. Did you take that into account? Did you look at that? The applicant is not requesting any relief in terms of off-street parking. The applicant is meeting the required off-street parking as dictated by the state of New Jersey. Do you have any opinion on whether or not um, uh, parking would be practical along that driveway? The applicant has adequate off-street parking proposed on both lines. You know, we'll have Mr. Walker uh, get into some of the engineering aspect of this, so that's why he stayed. So, okay, I'd appreciate that because the witness is not answering my question. He keeps referring to what the applicant is seeking rather than giving me the benefit of his opinion as a professional planner. You know, we'll have Mr. Walker address this. Thank you. Stay where you are, please. And Mr. Walker, why don't you address uh, the gentleman? Turn on. Turn on.
Um, so the driveway is a, the paved part is 11 feet wide, and then we have two two sections of three foot stone adjacent to it, which which can be parked on. So we have a total width of 17 feet. So conceivably, when we're grading this plan out, we'll create an area where maybe one tire would be uh, on the lawn area, just beyond to, to provide enough room to pass through. So. Uh, obviously, that that is definitely a concern um, where where you have a section of long driveway to get to the house. You need a place to park and to turn around. So we do have that uh, the common uh, turnaround area that's that's shown uh, for the larger lot in the back uh, and a very large uh, driveway pad for the first lot on the smaller lot. But yeah, I, I think that's a it's a very good point and. Uh, we'll work that into our plan, but even with the, the 17 feet with the two, three foot sections uh, and the 11 foot pavement, there's, there's just about enough room there to park a car and, and be able to pass by. Just to clarify, you're not suggesting that uh, parking would be accomplished or used on that turnaround, are you? Uh, for, for a party that could be parked in there, sure. It's just for an emergency vehicle situation. So if there's an emergency, cars would have to be moved so the vehicle could turn around. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Okay. Seeing none, Mr. Chavis, would you like to give us a summation? Well, uh, first thing, just as a matter of housekeeping, uh, the first exhibit that we introduced was um, uh, exhibit A1. So just the background on that, I placed an inquiry to Joseph Burrell, the uh, uh, county planner, uh, and I make the request for an aerial photograph, give him the lot and block, and this is what the county of Morris produces in response to that request. It's a very helpful request. Many counties don't provide it. The county of Morris maintains this, and uh, they go back many years. I always ask for the most current so this document, A1, is a government record produced by the Morris County Planning Board. It's free of charge to the public. They made the request, and they were gracious enough uh, to provide it. So that's where this came from. Thank you. Yeah. As far as uh, closing comments, I don't know if anybody in the public has any case yeah, they I want would, to present. Thank you. I, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, recommend that the members of the public make comment to the extent they already haven't. Before. And then uh, close with the uh, applicant to Mr. finish this with summation. Mr. Chairman, I have one yes, question. Yes, Ms. Murphy. So I have one question. We were presented with a plan A and a plan B. Uh, I, I heard our professionals indicate a preference for plan A, which has the property line running down the driveway. Um, what I'd like to hear from our applicant is, do they have a preference in terms of the plan A or plan B? And if so, why? Well, I would say this. <clears throat> from a practical standpoint, the plan that's submitted this evening, plan A, I'll call it, makes the most sense. And the reason it makes the most sense is because the commonality of driveway is only 75 feet. Okay. And therefore, as uh, Mr. Slade had said, and, and as part of his uh, response on the topic, uh, that from an engineering standpoint, that makes the most sense. Now, from a uh, tax map standpoint, uh, plan B makes more sense because it looks more regular. But the reality is nobody driving by this property is ever going to know where the property line is. So it makes no practical difference. And I think that if you weigh the benefits associated with what appears on the tax map as compared to where the property line is actually located and what the benefits are in maintaining ownership in fee of that driveway, that the benefits associated with fee ownership over the driveway outweigh the benefits of how it looks on a piece of paper. And, and in light of the fact from a, a visual standpoint, you're never going to see the difference. Uh, we would say that what we submitted, Plan A, is the best option. But okay. we gave it to the board because I realized, you know, people like choices. And if we can give you a choice that perhaps satisfies a concern uh, that we didn't see, you know, you have that option. And, and if I'm, uh, I'm not able to read this very well because of the small print in my old eyes, but it looks like it's about a half acre difference in terms of the, the first one is about 0.8. About 0.8 acres, if I can read that properly, and the other one's about 1.3. Well, it's not the age of your eyes that makes it so that it's difficult <laughs> to read it. It's microfilm. It's just print. very small print. Uh, so, 
just to summarize, right? Yeah. The smaller lot in the plan set that you have is about two times the size of the zone. So zone requirements, 15,000, that's yeah. 30,073. Under the other plan. Plan it, it, B. Plan B, it goes to 52,964 square. Uh, 22,000 square feet. Okay. E either way, you're okay from a zone more, standpoint. More than, you're more than enough property. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any question, uh, excuse me, comments from the public on this application? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to close the public commentary. Now you may. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank everybody for your time and your consideration, and uh, we appreciate it. We know everybody's time is valuable. Yours is valuable. We appreciate you sharing it with us. You know, uh, Ms. Graviano said something that I think is really telling about this application and that the lot is very unusual. And that's why I wanted to get you an aerial photograph from the county. When you look at the aerial photograph, which has the tax map overlaid on it, and you see the anomaly of this lot being five acres in a zone that permits lots of a third of an acre, it really is... Uh, enormous compared to the minimum lot area uh, in the zone. And when you look at a zoning ordinance, generally, I think there's two items of an ordinance that are really the most important when you talk about uh, zoning. One is use and two is lot area. In many ways, lot area ties into use because it ties into density. You know, two, two houses on one property increases the density by 100 percent. And clearly that's not good zoning. And in this particular instance, where you have a lot that's so grossly oversized for the minimum lot area of the zone, in its very nature, it's out of character. And what the applicant is proposing is to bring the property into greater character with the single family neighborhood, bringing uh, one lot of 30,000 square feet and the other one still uh, grossly oversized. Uh, but it also provides an opportunity that you don't see much anymore, especially here in Morris County. And that's the opportunity to create a single family building lot. You know, I was in the courtroom when the Honorable Marianne Neergard uh, was having words with the uh, borough attorney from Madison. And she made a statement uh, as Mr. Quigley. She says, Mr. Quigley, until they anoint me Empress of New Jersey, I will follow the direction of the New Jersey Supreme Court. And your town needs X number of units of affordable housing, etc. Now, I have nothing against high density residential. I have nothing against affordable housing. Every town in the county is, is required to meet its constitutional obligation. But what's missing is that drive for affordable housing and high density residential has made single family residential development nearly non-existent. When was the last time somebody came before you with a multi-lot uh, uh, major subdivision? You just don't see it anymore because the pressure is on the municipalities to create high density residential and any land that is available. I mean, even now what's coming out of Trenton recently is placing even a greater burden on the municipalities to create that. But there's no burden on the municipality to create additional single family building lots. And these are, are gonna be like hen's teeth uh, or unicorns. Nobody's gonna be coming before you on this in the, year, in the years to come because the pressure is going to be on uh, accessory housing in backyards. We've seen that coming out. And then likewise, high density residential, because this is what the drive is. And as Marianne Neergaard appropriately pointed out, until they anointed her Empress of New Jersey, she followed the New Jersey Supreme Court and mandated so many units here and there and everywhere. And I'm sure this municipality has had to meet its obligation as well. And like I say, I have nothing against it. I'm sure the board has nothing against it. But what it does is it artificially dries up opportunity for single family residential. And you have a high demand. I mean, you have many people that want to stay in this township, that there is no opportunity to buy a house. And if you find a house and it's for sale, people are bidding on it to the point where it becomes astronomical and, and the uh, inability for people to even stay in a town in a single family dwelling. So I would submit to you that... Comp uh, that as contrast to what happened in 2002 when this board, I realize none of you were here, or if you were, it's maybe one of them, that something has changed in New Jersey and something has changed here in this, in this town, as in every town in Morristown. There's hardly any more single family dwellings and there's hardly any opportunity for people that want to live in a single family dwelling to buy a new house. So I would submit to you that while this does not comport with the lot width 
uh, requirements of your ordinance, that the purpose of that ordinance to provide sufficient width to have a house that you're not, you know, you have sufficient side, sufficient side yard setbacks and buffers and the like, meaning the intent of the ordinance, sufficient light, air and open space is met. Now, is it a little unusual with the, the driveway? But it's nothing that is so unusual that this board has not approved it in the past. Story decisis aside, but <laughs> it does exist. And the point is, is it's only 75 feet, and I think it's very manageable from a, a deed uh, perspective. And I would submit to you that the purposes of the municipal land use law are furthered by this application because we are providing an opportunity for residential use, which is under great pressure, and it's eliminating. And there's very rare opportunities to pr provide this. And this is one of those opportunities that you have as a board to grant a C variance, if you will, or C variances, in order to effectuate a housing stock that is drying up rapidly and it is becoming priced out of reach for most people. So by pr providing this opportunity, you're providing an opportunity for two families to be able to own single family dwellings within this beautiful single family neighborhood. So I would submit to you that while variance is a necessity, uh, the lot itself cries out for relief because it is so large. And the other thing that I would point out is because of the requirements of the Department of Environmental Protection, we already have a deed restriction in place relative to the wetlands and the transition areas, the flood hazard area, the riparian buffer. These are all recorded restrictions on this property that prohibit tree removal and disturbance. I mean, if it's Mr. Walker testified, that you couldn't even remove a dead tree because they're seeing some environmental benefit. And I'm sure there is. You have raptors and other birds that sit up in these dead trees and pick off what's ever crawling on the ground. And as a result, 75 to 80 percent of this property is going to stay just the way it is. So I would submit to you that you could approve this in good conscience, knowing that you're creating an opportunity for something that is in high demand and low supply in this township. And that's a new single family dwelling. So for those reasons, we ask that you approve the project. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to move this along. The uh, next order of business, I would guess, is Mr. Warren. Can you give us an update on where we are with stipulations? Certainly, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, well, I'll, I'll uh, as best I can, and I'll be corrected where I'm wrong. I'll. I'll uh, lay out the relief sought and the conditions stipulated to by the applicant uh, for the board to can deliberate and uh, make a motion and, uh, and, and vote. Uh, minor subdivision one lot to two, along with four, uh, excuse me, four bulk variances. They're all minimum lot width. Proposed lot 8.01, approximately 32 feet versus 100 feet uh, let me start that again. 32 feet at the lot frontage uh, versus uh, the minimum lot width of 100 feet required. 39.6 feet at the front yard setback, which is 50 feet back from the property line uh, versus the 100 foot wide required. Uh, and 27.21 feet at 40 feet beyond the front yard setback uh, versus the 100 feet minimum lot width required. That's all for lot 8.01 and the fourth variance for lot 8.02. Lot width is 80 feet at the uh, lot frontage as opposed to the 100 foot minimum uh, uh, required lot width. In addition to those four variances, there's two design waivers, steep slopes uh, in the uh, range or category of 20 to 25 percent. 38.6% uh, uh, disturbed versus 33.3% maximum permitted to be disturbed and uh, in the range of greater than 25% slopes, 32% uh, uh, disturbed, whereas no disturbance is permitted. Those are the two design waivers. Now that we got through the relief, uh, the conditions stipulated to, as I understand them, are a 15-foot wide driveway and utility easement as between lots 8.01 and lot 8.02. All easements and instruments subject to review and approval of the board attorney and the uh, uh, board, uh, excuse me, township engineer uh, and to be recorded. Uh, so I won't repeat that for all of them. Tree removal and replacement ordinance compliance, soil erosion and sediment control. Uh, approval from Morris County Soil uh, Conservation District. 
uh, camera uh, uh, of the existing sanitary sewer line uh, and subject to review and approval of the township engineering department. Uh, three, two foot uh, depth of the stone shoulder uh, <coughs> along with one foot for the wick. Um, the uh, contractual agreement as between the two property owners uh, to be deed restricted uh, for purposes of uh, maintaining the 75 foot common driveway area, each with the right to maintain it in its entirety, uh, all to be recorded and set as previously stated. Uh, the tennis court will not remain and any uh, plan revisions will be made uh, as conditions subsequent uh, to clarify same. Uh, easement to the township if so desired by the township for access to the stream for maintenance purposes. Uh, deed restriction. Uh, Steve. Um, sometimes it gets even too difficult for me to read, doesn't it? The, uh, you I'll do a great job. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was a deed restriction for the tree replacement obligation. That's right. Um, so uh, th that'll be a deed restriction, that, that obligation as well. Uh, easement. Uh, for stormwater pipe discharge, approximately 25 feet by 25 feet recorded, subject to review and approval of our engineer. And uh, retaining walls will not exceed four feet <coughs> in height. And uh, within the legal area of development not outside okay that was the uh remove deed. dead and leaning trees ah thank you moving dead and i have it there okay. non-regulated area right okay all tree okay dead okay right dead or leaning trees will be uh removed from all non-regulated areas thank you electric utilities will be underground i would just change that all utilities underground Makes sense and uh in addition uh, those conditions that were uh, stipulated to by the applicant that were set forth in the tcc report and the uh to the extent a uh, certain ones were stip uh, stipulated to with respect to the environmental commission's recommendations in their april 5 2021 memo uh, and compliance with the Southeast Marsh County Municipal Utilities Authority uh, water meter and related requirements. And I'm missing. I would have uh, a condition related to the Evergreen, you know, some type of Evergreen buffer along us to. Oh, I, I left that out. That's seven, right. Seven How did I leave that out? I work with the planner on that. And that would also Thank be you. a substitution from a deciduous tree to Evergreen for replacement trees. Thank you, Jim. Oh, okay. I went right by it. One other thing that I had was the, uh, I think that key map is incorrect where it shows that lot as eight, that should be lot seven, and lot seven should be 7.01, so just a correction on that key map. Got it. Just to wonder, that is would it, be it for inappropriate the to ask one, one or two questions? Oh, that also presumes that it's all alternative A, not B, which seemed to be the preference of both the board and the applicant. Okay, so coming back to that is my first question to you. Is there a necessity for us to take a straw poll at this point or are we being proposed? I think- Option yeah. A and we're just gonna go with option A. Is not I, I think if someone wants to make a motion, uh, they can let us know which option they're going with. And, uh, okay, perfect. Second question is, is there was some test, a uh, question asked by one of, the uh, one of the members of the public about the firefighter turnaround. Will there be adequate signage in there letting people know that if there is an emergency, they have to move their cars when they're having a party? I, mean, I don't know what the fire department pulls in. What do they do? Honk on the horn for an hour until somebody moves their cars? How do we get them out of there? I, I don't right know. over. <laughs> so either you're allowed to put your house is on fire. You know, on that Public is, property. So then we'll have no parking in the firefighter turnaround? No, there'll be parking allowed in the fire. People are going to park there anyway. The house is you can't stop it. You, you, you. The second question I had for you was the stone um, on either side of the driveways. Is that stone above the elevation of the driveway, which we're concerned about plowing? 
Uh, no, we're going to be in the driveway, and we'll get a detail on that. No other questions? Anyone else? No. Okay. I'm assuming he said it, but I didn't hear the DEP permit. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Out, yeah, I, no, I was listening for it, and I might have missed Well, it. yeah, all, all required agency <laughs> approvals are always in there, but then including but not limited to the DEP general permit 10A. Okay, we'll entertain a motion, and then we'll have discussion if it's second. I'll make a motion to approve the application. Application. A? A, yes, as proposed. As proposed with, with all stipulations, stipulations outlined by. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, is there any discussion among the board members? Seeing none, Sonia, will you call a roll call vote? Mr. Flowers. Yes. Ms. Van Orla. Yes. Mr. Nunn. Yes. Mr. Rabbit. Nice to see a single family home being built. Yes. Ms. Murphy. Yes. Mr. Benoit. Yes. Mr. Barrett. Yes. Mr. Rivia. Yes. 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 Okay, we'll move into uh, other matters. Is thank you. A, thank you. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Do we have a le you. legislative committee report? Nope. Okay. I see a resolution for Joseph Scoopian, stormwater management consultant. Is that the vote? Yeah, we have uh, a motion second and a roll call vote to adopt the resolution, and that's for professional services for stormwater management. Jim, if I may, is, is that for a particular application or? Because we usually have him, I put on an annual basis. Yeah, and you know what? Excuse me, folks, we're still in, in the session here. Sorry, appreciate it. No problem. Thank so you. It is general in nature, but yeah. it did come back up with the, uh, the Red Bull more uh, uh, work with uh, concern about the golf course. So we need a motion to accept this uh, resolution by Mr. Scoopian. I'll make the motion. A second. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Right. Roll, roll, roll. Oh, sorry. Roll, 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 roll. <laughs> yes. Ben Water. Yes. 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 Last item of business is there any public comments? Seeing that their public has ran out the door, I would say there is none. Sony, do we have a, a hearing on the 17th? Right now, my agenda is open. When will we know for sure whether your agenda is closed? That's in a 10 day notice? Three, three days? Four days? So we'll know by Thursday? By week, there was a second. Next week, I'll let you know. Definitely. Right. Well, you just need right. the notice. You just need the notice uh, period. Is there anything right. ending that? That's been a notice in the next three days? No. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's any I'll issues. entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that. Second. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Okay, let's get out of here.